Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to um, the next um, in our 2021 series of, of the Magnet Seminars. Uh, we've been going strong for quite a while and, and um, we had some really great uh, support from our community. So thank you, everybody, uh, for coming along and thank you to um, all of our pre uh, presenters, uh, past, present and future. Um, just a quick reminder for those who haven't joined us before. Um, the Magnet Seminars are, are 25 minute, 30 minute uh, presentations. So we kindly ask that you keep your microphones uh, muted um, um, during the, the presentation. And if you have uh, problems with your um, internet connection, um, turning off your video can, can help improve that. Um, after the seminar, we'll have um, time for a 10 to 15 minute um, question session and discussion session. And questions are, are welcomed via the um, text chat as well as uh, via the microphone. Um, if you don't want to speak um, with the microphone, please just type into the chat, no mic, and I myself or one of our co-hosts will um, read out the question um, for you. Uh, and as always, we've got our, um, our lives going on around us in, in still in the midst of a global pandemic. So if you do have to get up and go uh, halfway through, please just um, get up and go. It's absolutely fine. Uh, and at the end of the, the, the seminar, we have some time uh, for a bit of a catch up, a bit of a, a social um, um, time for us to chat with each other and just see how everybody is is getting on. Um, and this part of this, the, the seminar series isn't actually recorded, so uh, you won't have to, you can unmute and you can uh, show your video. Um, so today we have uh, Beck Strauss, who is from uh, not only from NIST, but also from NASA. Um, and they will be talking about um, constraining uh, the moon's magnetic field from the analysis of Apollo samples. So Beck, thank you very much for uh, speaking today. Thanks very much for having me. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, we see in my slides all right? Perfect. Great. Um, thank you again for having me today. It's a little bit intimidating to follow Lisa Tokes, but I will do my best. Um, again, for those who haven't met me before, I'm Beck Strauss. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I am a term research scientist at NIST, currently on detail to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So today I'm going to talk with you a little bit about how we can use Apollo samples to study the decline of the moon's magnetic field. So, uh, Measurements from orbiters, landers, and portable magnetometers at the moon have told us that the moon does not have a strong magnetic field in the present day. And in fact, these, uh, these measurements generally agree that the surface field intensity there is on the order of somewhere less than one nanotesla, which is pretty weak. And for paleomagnetic purposes, we can think of the modern moon as essentially a zero field environment. Now, the big exception to this is some regions of magnetized crust or crustal anomalies, some of which are associated with features like craters and lunar swirls. And we can take these as evidence that the moon must have had a much stronger magnetic field in the past. To understand the history of that field, we've been working with material from the Apollo sample suite, which is made up of more than 2000 rock, regolith, and core samples collected by the Apollo astronauts and returned to Earth. These collections are now available primarily through Johnson Space Center and the CAPTEM program, which has recently changed to XMAG, the Extraterrestrial Materials Analysis Group. When I think about studies of lunar paleomagnetism, it's uh, most helpful to conceptualize them on a timeline. So here I've got billions of years before the present on our x-axis with the present day all the way to the right and paleo intensity or the strength of the ancient field on the y-axis in microteslas, please note that that is a log scale. There are two kinds of data on this plot. First, the filled shapes indicate actual records of ancient magnetic fields, and the open shapes indicate maximum intensities those fields could have had based on the recording limits of the associated samples, which I'll come back to in a little bit. So I wanna point out some big trends in this collection of data to help guide your eye through how we usually interpret it. Uh, there is a generally recognized high field period when the moon's magnetic field reached surface intensities um, of an average of 77 microteslas, somewhere between 3.56 and 3.85 billion years ago, excuse me. Subsequent to the high field period, a series of studies established that there was no longer any evidence for fields stronger than about four microteslas by around 3.19 billion years ago. 
Now, from that information alone, we can start constructing this kind of generic schematic curve. This is not quantitative. This is purely intended to guide your eye through the data. So a few years ago, another study came out that found an actual record of a roughly five microtesla field in a much younger sample dated to somewhere between one and two billion years old. And a study that was published last year in 2020 uh, showed that there was no evidence for fields any stronger than about 0.1 microteslas by a half a billion years ago. So that was a lot all at once. The main thing that we're interested here, interested in here is that the paleomagnetic data from Apollo samples seems to indicate the moon's field didn't just up and turn off one day, rather it went through a couple of periods of decline. We're really interested in these dynamic changes in the intensity of the lunar field because intensities of magnetic fields tell us something about planetary interiors. A whole bunch of mechanisms, at least a dozen, have been proposed to explain why the moon had a strong magnetic field at some point and what might have happened to it. And I'm just going to mention a few of the major ones here. Some studies have looked into chemical convection dynamos or impact generated dynamo systems, which would have been able to account for fields on the order of maybe seven to 10 microteslas, but wouldn't have lasted much past 3.8 billion years ago. Other studies have looked into precession dynamos, where the interior and exterior portions of the moon could have been decoupled and moved relative to each other. And that motion and the associated stirring might have been enough to generate the currents we need for magnetic fields. That could have given us field strengths on the order of 100 microteslas and would have lasted till maybe 2 billion years ago, depending whose model you like for how far the moon was from the Earth at any given point in time. And still other studies have looked at thermochemical convection, similar to what we have on the Earth today. This would have been able to sustain fields on the order of 5 or 6 microteslas till maybe a billion years ago tops. So you may be looking at this and rightly saying to yourself, there is not very much data on this plot. What that means is we really need to keep an eye on small number statistics problems and make sure we're not creating these big assertions out of a uh, statistical anomaly. So I want to answer a couple of questions in this study. The first is, did the lunar dynamo really decline after 3.56 billion years ago? Or are we suffering from a small amount of data? Could there be methodological problems or issues with our materials? And second, if the dynamo did decline, what happened to it? What kind of change in mechanism could explain this, this change in state that we observe? To answer these questions, we need to work with samples that are capable of recording weak magnetic fields after 3.2 billion years ago. So that brings us to a case study using some Apollo 12 basalts. This is uh, primarily work that I did with Sonia Tiku while we were both at Rutgers University, and we just had it published in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets. So we'll start with a field map for the field geologists in the room. Uh, this is the location where our samples were co collected at the Apollo 12 landing site. Please pardon the truck noise in the background. Um, all three samples were collected from the sort of upper left edge of this image. And I have photos from a couple of the locations where our samples were picked up. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo for where the third sample was collected. And this, I think, is a point in favor of sending more geologists to the moon because we know to take a picture before we mess with the field site. So these are the actual samples that we worked with. Uh, we got much smaller pieces, of course. These are each about the size of the palm of your hand. These are Apollo 12 samples, 12008, 12009, and 12015. And just for fun, uh, after all of the analyses, I did take a couple of photos of me holding the samples. You may notice that each of our little subsample slices has an orienting arrow on the disk to which it's attached. And this is because we wanted to preserve the relative orientation of subsamples from each of our main samples even though the bulk samples themselves were not oriented on collection. Okay, so all three of these rocks are olivine vitrifier mare basalts, and our microscopy didn't turn up any evidence of major shock effects, so we are going to assert that these were most likely magnetized through a TRM, a thermo remnant magnetization. We determined new argon-argon ages for two of these samples and the first ever argon-argon ages for the third and dated all three of them to about 3.1 billion years ago, which is exactly what we had been hoping for. Now, because these samples were rapidly cooled and have a fine overall grain size, our hope was that they might contain some fine-grained magnetic material that would make them good paleomagnetic recorders. And at this scale, we were able to observe some bright metallic grains that we thought might be the iron nickel grains suggested by previous studies to exist in these samples. Okay, I'm going to go right into our paleomagnetic results first. The first question we asked was, did these samples record a field when they formed? 
Now, usually when I give this talk, I'm talking to people who have never, uh, never thought about magnets before. So I go through a little explanation of how we build Zydrafeld diagrams and what they're kind of supposed to look like and how the data should trend toward the origin. Um, but I think in this group, I can probably just show you my data. Uh, if you are familiar with Seiderfeld plots at all, you may be noticing that these are statistically indistinguishable from spaghetti, at least once we remove this low coercivity component that's consistent with an overprint from just hanging out in the Earth's magnetic field for about 50 years. So unfortunately, we're looking at the data that's indistinguishable from noise, and what that means is we were not able to retrieve a stable high coercivity magnetization through a standard AFD mag of the NRM. So then we asked, how weak a field could these samples have recorded if there was a field present at the time? Now, this is an important question to ask in lunar studies because the paleomagnetic techniques that were used during the Apollo era were not always able to differentiate between samples that did not record an ancient magnetic field and samples that just had poor remnants or shoddy recording properties, or between samples that did record strong planetary fields and those that had just picked up spurious remnants on Earth. So to determine the fidelity limits for these three samples, we performed a series of laboratory experiments in which we were essentially applying a magnetic field of a known intensity to each sample to simulate a TRM at room temperature because NASA doesn't love it when you cook their rocks, um, and then attempted to get back a record of that applied field using the same AFD mag methods that we had to try to get at NRM in the first place. The hope being that we should see a one-to-one -one relationship between the applied field and the retrieved field. Here are the results of those analyses. Uh, if you look at the plot all the way to the left, we have our applied laboratory field on the x-axis in microteslas and the retrieved paleo intensity on the y-axis, again in microteslas. And ideally, all of our data should cluster around this one-to-one uh, -one line that I've got in gray dash here. It's kind of hard to see exactly what's happening from that figure alone. So if you look instead at the middle figure, we're replotting, we're replotting exactly the same data in a different way. Now we have the applied field on the x-axis and the difference between the applied field and the retrieved field on the y. And using this 100% difference cutoff from some previous studies, we found that two of our samples could give us back good records of fields as weak as seven microteslas, and one of our samples was able to give us back good records of fields as weak as four microteslas, which is pretty good. So we would say that our AF methods would have been capable of retrieving records of a weak TRM if the magnetizing fields were any stronger than about four to seven microteslas. You may recall from two slides ago that we did no such thing. So let's go back to our timeline for a second. Uh, we have some new argon-argon dates, we have some new fidelity limits, and we can add our three points onto this timeline, effectively quadrupling the amount of data available between 3.1 and 3.2 billion years ago, um, which is sort of fun to say. Uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about this study is that we got results that are in really nice agreement with previous work, and this is essentially a replication study. Um, a hill that I will eventually die on is that we should be able to do more studies like that. Because what this lets us do is we can think back to this small number of statistics issue I brought up at the front of the talk and ask, is the decline that we're seeing actually statistically significant? We wanted to determine whether the paleo intensities in the high field period and the intensity limits determined in this period of initial field decline are really derived from separate populations or separate events, or whether they could be coming from the same initial distribution of paleo intensity values. So prior to this study, just looking at literature, uh, a KS test gave us a p-value of 0 0.0152, saying these are almost certainly not from, excuse me, these are almost certainly not random or from the same initial distribution. Uh, but when we add our three data points, we're enabled to improve that result by an order of magnitude and say with much more confidence that there was about an order of magnitude field decline subsequent to the high field period on the moon. So now we can extend our generic schematic line uh, and say with a little bit more confidence too that following the high field period, there was a state change that put us into a sustained weak field period for some additional period of time. So again, the reason that we're interested in these kinds of questions about changing intensity is that they tell us something about the mechanisms by which the field was generated. And the hope is that by improving our constraint of the timeline, we can eliminate some of these candidate mechanisms from our plot. 
I'm not going to talk about that right now, though. What I do want to talk about instead is the question of what is recording these fields. So I really want to talk about mineralogy today because these three samples have particularly excellent fidelity properties for lunar rocks, and I got pretty excited about trying to figure out why. So previous studies have showed that the ferromagnetic mineralogy of lunar rocks is primarily metallic iron and chemosite, which is a low nickel iron nickel alloy. And I wanted to explore a little and see what we could do with that information. So at Rutgers, we had access to an electron microprobe. Uh, what you're looking at here in the second through fourth columns are qualitative elemental X-ray maps, which we collected in addition to obtaining quantitative points from individual grains. You can basically think of each pixel in each image as representing a single data point. So if you look at the third column, which has this kind of navy blue background, uh, we're showing iron in blue and nickel in green. And from that, we can say we were definitely seeing some actual iron nickel grains, which is pretty cool. I do want to highlight a few things that we noticed during these observations, though. Uh, first, we found grains with different iron nickel ratios within each sample, and we were able to identify both chemosite and martensite in this total collection of grains. In fact, we were mostly finding martensite, which is a slightly higher nickel content than chemosite. We also saw that many of these iron nickel grains are not homogeneous. So in this figure, you can see some compositional gradients across a few, but not all, of the grains that I'm showing. Um, there are color differences across the grains. And we also observed some very likely iron nickel grains of a submicron size that were unfortunately too small to acquire quantitative points from individually. So in summary, we were able to observe what we're pretty sure are multiple grain sizes of both chemosite and martensite. Again, pretty cool. We'd also been thinking about some uh, studies that were published recently suggesting that association with troilite, which is an iron sulfide mineral, might be an indicator of good paleomagnetic fidelity in lunar basalts. But we went looking, and that's what's going on with this fourth column, where now we've got sulfur in magenta and iron in blue. And we didn't find any grains with compositions consistent with troilite. So in general, we would say that troilite may be forming through processes that also produce submicron iron grains in some lunar rocks, but it's clearly not a requirement in order for lunar rocks to have good paleo intensity fidelity. So then we also did some hysteresis experiments. Um, the figures here are each showing a representative subsample of one of our three main samples. And we've got our applied field strength in Teslas on the X axis and the measured moment in amp meters squared on the Y axis. The, er the orange curves are raw data and the blue curves are corrected for parametric slope. You might rec uh, recognize the IRMDB software output here. I've also pulled out some of the parameters that we use to define the shape and size of each of our loops, and I will come back to that very shortly. So our measurements were dominated by diamagnetic and paramagnetic contributions, probably because we were using very small samples for these particular experiments. Um, but we did also observe some open loops that we thought could be suggestive of multi-domain states. And I want to note that they could also be explained by some combination of having extremely weak samples and some known thermal disequilibrium issues with the particular AGFM that we were using. Okay, so let's step back for a second and talk about domain behavior in lunar rocks beyond these three samples. What I'm showing here is a day plot, and these are typically used to understand the hysteresis parameters of different samples relative to each other. Now, I know that the terrestrial folks in the room may be a little bit alarmed to see this here, especially if you are familiar with Andy Roberts's seminal 2018 paper, A Critical Appraisal of the Day Diagram, but I ask you to please bear with me because there is a point that I'm gonna try to make with this. Um, so on our x-axis, we have remnant coercivity divided by coercive force, and on our y-axis, we've got saturation remnant magnetization divided by saturation magnetization. And the general hope with a day plot like this is that samples with better recording properties should plot toward the upper left and may correspond with better magnetic fidelity. So what we built in our study is to our knowledge, the largest published compilation of hysteresis parameters from Apollo samples to date. Each data point that you're seeing here represents one sample or subsample from literature sorted by bulk rock type kind of as a first pass. And the data from our study is in the orange squares. I've also included these gray dashed lines to indicate domain state regions from the original day plot. So I'll note the positions of samples from a few recent studies on this figure, just by way of example. And you can kind of get a sense from this handful of points that the general trend we're hoping for does seem to hold. We see better lower fidelity limits as we look toward the upper left of the plot. However, there is a problem. OK, there's like there's a bunch of problems with this figure, but I'm just going to focus on one today. Um, those dashed lines do not actually exist. 
The guiding domain parameter ranges were originally developed for magnetite and are not applicable to other kinds of magnetic minerals. And this is crucial because not a single one of the samples shown on this plot, nor any of the samples used to build that paleo intensity timeline contain magnetite. All that being said, we built this plot in the first place because I wanted to understand our samples in context. About half of the data that you see here was collected prior to the invention of forks when this technique really was the cutting edge. And I'm convinced that we can at least start some useful discussions about how to go forward by making these kinds of comparisons. So long story short, I'm very proud of the data compilation that we assembled here, and it is freely available at the NIST data repository with the link at the bottom of the slide. Um, but I do strongly caution against using day plots to determine specific domain states or grain sizes for the magnetic minerals in lunar samples. Okay, if you zoned out or went to check your phone, I'm now gonna summarize my whole talk in about a minute and a half. What happened to the lunar field after 3.56 billion years ago? Our methods would have been able to retrieve a record if the magnetizing field was any stronger than about four to seven microteslas. However, we did not retrieve a stable record of a magnetization consistent with that kind of planetary field. Therefore, we find no evidence for lunar surface fields any stronger than seven microteslas at about 3.1 billion years ago. And as a reminder, this is roughly an order of magnitude decline in field intensity over about 370 million years. In order to explain this, we need either multiple mechanisms of field generation or a bistable dynamo, for which the idea would be some dynamo system that could sustain itself in a strong state, get destabilized, and then be reasserted in a weak state. We think it's a little bit more likely that we're looking at multiple mechanisms here, and we're particularly interested in a precession di generated dynamo, which could have given way to an underlying thermochemical convection system after the moon reached such a distance from the earth that its gravitational state uh, destabilized the precession required to produce those strong, field, those strong fields. And with that, uh, I will leave up a few of our major takeaways. I wanna say thank you again for having me today. It's a real honor to be part of the Magnet series. I want to thank the CAPTEM program for sample allocation. Um, and thank you to the two folks, I think maybe in the audience today who reviewed our paper and gave some really genuinely constructive feedback that actually uh, really helped with the, the draft that we were putting together. I also want to very, make a very quick plug. Uh, if you are going to LPSC, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, in a couple of weeks, I'm giving two presentations. One is on uh, magnetic domain, domain behavior and interpretation in Apollo samples, where I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on lunar magnetic mineralogy. And I'm also presenting a poster on some work that I've been leading on gender inclusive study methods in planetary science and related fields, and how we can be more welcome to, uh, welcoming to trans and non-binary people in our study areas. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Beck. That was a great presentation. Uh, really, really, really good. Um, we are ready now to take questions. If uh, anybody, yeah, a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> if, you if you don't want to uh, speak, you can drop your question in the chat as well. Courtney says, awesome talk. Thank you, Beck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, no question? I'll, yeah. I will get the, sorry, I'll get the ball rolling um, on some questions. So you, you, you're talking about um, uh, a sort of order of magnitude drop um, over, over, sorry, what, what length of time uh, was it? 370 million years or so. Yeah. I mean, have you thought about how that compares to some of the, the changes that we see in terrestrial uh, paleo intensity data? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is something that actually our reviewers gave us very good feedback on. Uh, we've gotten into the habit of describing these periods of decline as rapid because the temporal resolution of data that we have for the moon's magnetic field is so sparse. So when something happens one billion years ago and something else happens three billion years ago, everything in the middle feels really fast when you have nothing to compare to. But compared to terrestrial systems, this 370 million year decline is probably quite slow. And in order to get a little bit more nuance about that, honestly, this is one of the biggest pitches for both improving our access to doing magnetic studies of the Apollo sample suite, because we have all this 
this material available, we might be able to get better resolution, but also a pitch for thinking about how we do sample return in the future. And with lunar missions like Artemis and even Mars missions, we can think about how to um, improve coverage that might let us get at things like, for instance, reversals. I have no idea if there were reversals on the moon because we just don't have the, the data to show that yet. Thank you. Uh, James, uh, is his hand up? You Hi, Beth. That was a really nice talk. Thank you for giving that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that most of the grains in your samples are, are martensite. Um, and I just wanted to kind of ask uh, what you thought the actual going through the martensite transition will have done to a painting density. Will it have been like a, a re recording? Will it be a CRM? Will it be a TRM? Will it be a CRM that's carrying a TRM? Like what actually sort of um, mechanically is happening there? And what do you think the impacts of that would be on a painting density you recover from a sample like this? Mm -hmm. So our, our current understanding of this, and I do want to like go on a tangent about how we need to understand Martin site more thoroughly in this context separately. Um, but our current understanding of this is that the, the um, transition into Martin site was likely happening very rapidly looking at the grain sizes that we see and the textures that are visible in our microscopy. We think that these rocks overall cooled like less than a day, something on that order. And from that, we are continuing to refer to this as a TRM. Um, there, we've done a little bit of digging into literature and it seems that the overall magnetic behavior of chemosite and martensite are likely very similar. So I think the assumptions that we've made in order to do these ARM to TRM calculations probably continue to hold for martensite just because of that speed. Um, but I would very much like to do a deep dive into exactly what the nuances of these, like, honestly, these are ranges of compositions, right? We say martensite for things going from 5% up to 25% nickel. And then I talk to my material science colleagues and they're like, that's like eight different things, you know? Um, so I, if you have more thoughts on this, I would very much like to, to chat about that further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Castable, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just wondering um, what the prospects really are for filling in based on the Apollo samples. Uh, I, I, I assume that many of them have been dated and I'm guessing you've looked at that array of dates and thought a little bit about the composition. How many samples do you think you could get from there or do you really think you're gonna to have to go back? So it's, it's really a Goldilocks game, right? Like you need a sample that both has been dated and is from the correct time period and has formed in such a way that it likely could be holding a good record based on mineralogy and speed and other processes it's been through and handling and whatnot. Um, and at the end of that, uh, I actually have a proposal in related to this where I think we might be able to get on the order of like a hundred samples would be cool. Maybe a couple hundred would have the information that we need currently without doing any further dating analyses or any further moon missions. Um, but if we want to do better than a hundred or a couple of hundred data points, which is what we would expect for like a comparable terrestrial study, then that's where we really have to have conversations about changing the way we think about sample return. And there is of course also the additional layer here where the processes by which new rocks are being formed on the moon are very much relegated to particular time periods. It's not like we have continuous lava flows occurring all along that entire timeline. Um, so the the cross section of information that we have is I don't think all 2000 samples would give me good information, but we could definitely improve what I'm currently showing by doubling or tripling the information. And, and that would still, of course, be a somewhat, uh, I, I don't really have an idea of what, how that spotty rec record would look. Yeah, it would still be, it would still be sparse by terrestrial standards. Um, but this is like one of the one of what I think of are both the funnest parts and the hardest parts of doing planetary magnetism. So if we use terrestrial studies as the standard, what I'm showing today is like almost nothing. I've said a huge amount from three data points, but if we look at Mars, for instance, we're doing way better than we have done for the intensity timeline for Mars. So it's really a, it's kind of a relativistic game, but I think we can do a lot better. I mean, I think if you look at three billion years ago on the earth, we're not doing that well either. That's fair, <laughs> that's a fair point. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else has questions? 
Elliot, remember that you have an answer for the pressing question of the day regarding Beck's background image, if you want it. Oh, yes. Um, just context for anyone who tuned in a second late. I am standing in front of an image from Lady Gaga's Chromatica album, and no one has yet been able to identify the original land feature that this was photoshopped on top of. So, uh, Elliot, what do you think it is? Rona Pinnacles in California. I, I didn't work it out. I did a bit of Google, so. And... <laughs> Still counts. That's literature research. I'll count that. Yes, but, but I have confirmation. So yes, it, it's Trona Pinnacles in California. Awesome. Thank you. I demand a cookie in prize. <laughs> You'll get it. <laughs> thank you. Awesome talk, though. So thank you very much. That, that was deeply enjoyable. Thank you. Any more questions? Andre, you have your hand up. Yeah, well, uh, I got intrigued with your uh, the, uh, high stories properties compilation. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, but uh, still, uh, I would advocate a little bit the old version of uh, of ideas of the, the, we all had about day plot with all the reservations that Eddie did two years ago, three years ago. Uh, sti uh, still. Uh, if you have uh, if you have uh, generally very low MRSMS ratios and very high HCRHC ratios, uh, does it uh, is it not showing you that uh, you have uh, you have a lot of uh, very fine super paramagnetic grains in your samples, and have you looked at this using maybe low temperature measurements? So I haven't looked into that specifically with these samples. The, the big day plot that I'm showing is really compiled from literature and we haven't been able to do further experiments due to pandemic. Because the, the, the question about SP is super paramagnetic grains is that unfortunately, if you have a, a lots of them in your sample, they, they are bound to be a very bad uh, uh, recording of any paleomagnetic information, you would agree. So maybe it might be, uh, might be uh, think to uh, look uh, look into because I, I can't remember many uh, low temperature measurements on lunar samples in particular. Yeah, it's I I'm racking my brain as you're saying that, and I think that's one of the cases of like something that I want to put together following this work is recommendations for how we can do better in the future. And so exactly. one of the things that I've been really focusing on is forks because that's now a tool that's kind of becoming bread and butter in terrestrial paleo. Uh, you, you, you haven't shown one. But, I uh, haven't shown one because I don't have any for my own samples. And oh, yeah. I was only able to find like one or two studies that have collected okay, them. Okay, okay. So, so they, it's, they it's a matter the, of future, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you um, very much. Very, very good talk. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I do want to say that the kind of low temperature experiments you're recommend you're suggesting are exactly the kind of thing I think we can start to recommend. Yeah, uh, well, uh, it's it's pretty simple. It's fast fast enough. And as far as far as I read about the new developments at, uh, in Minnesota, it's hard, the IRM they've got this uh, nice machine uh, in PMS three, which is much faster than the previous one, and much, much nicer and you can collect, let's say 20, uh, 20 times more data uh, uh, through the same time. So just keep going. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. For sure, thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Uh, Laurie, you have your hand up. You wanna ask a question? You may want to unmute yourself. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, great talk, Beck. Uh, really interesting. I have a question that's a little off from what you were talking about, but you did mention the crustal anomalies. Mm -hmm. And can you say anything about what you think the source of those are, internal or external or whatever? Um, I, I can vaguely say that I'm on the side of buried source bodies of some kind, but I haven't the more I learn about lunar swirls, the more I learn that I don't know anything about lunar swirls. So I will unfortunately have to punt that question to a colleague who, who has been focusing more on those features. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So any other questions? The 
no? I guess. Yes, if we have uh, no more questions, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up um, uh, this week's magnet. So I just want to thank Beck again for another uh, fantastic and really uh, interesting talk. Um, it's a great diversity that we're building up now in, in the kind of things that we cover uh, in these series. So it's, it's really, uh, really great to have that. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, so just a, a quick reminder of our um, upcoming uh, schedule. Um, in a couple of weeks, we will have uh, Andre um, will be giving us a, a talk. Um, and a couple of weeks after that, we have an open slot. So if anybody is interested in presenting uh, their work here at Magnets, please just um, get in touch. Uh, and then we'll have Andrea Biderman um, into April. And as before, we'll, we'll have a break for EGU. And then after EGU, we'll move to um, a time slot that's a little bit more favorable for uh, our colleagues in the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, China, and Japan, and we'll have more information about that coming uh, coming soon. Um, but as always, we're looking for um, many more speakers. Um, if anybody has any thoughts or suggestions, um, please get in touch. And any form of feedback or, or comments are always very, very welcome. Um, and just thank you, everybody, again, for uh, coming along for another Magnets. Cheers. <laughs>